Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello, I'm Bethany Wesley. Welcome to Lakeland Currents. For tonight's show, I'm pleased to welcome to the program Wayne Brandt. Wayne is the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries and Minnesota Timber Producers Association. Together, we will be discussing the logging and timber industry and its impact on our local economies and communities. Wayne has served on numerous forestry and natural resource related committees in the private and public sectors and is currently a gubernatorial appointee to the Minnesota Forest Resources Council. Welcome to the program. Thanks for inviting me, Bethany. So first, as we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about the two, uh, the two, the two uh, organizations. organizations you're from. Thank you, sorry. Sure. And how they differ from each other. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, Minnesota Timber Producers Association uh, was formed in 1937. It's uh, comprised of uh, loggers, uh, truckers, sawmills, allied businesses. Really has been the, the voice of uh, the timber industry for many generations. Minnesota Forest Industries members are uh, larger primary manufacturers of forest products. So here in the Bemidji area, Norboard, uh, Potlatch with the sawmill, uh, the paper mills uh, in the state, uh, large forest landowners, uh, companies that produce uh, electricity from biomass, utility poles, uh, pallets, uh, a whole host of things. So kind of one is larger uh, companies and one is uh, the independent loggers. A lot of shared interests though across the two. Many mutual uh, interests. Uh, we share staff uh, between the two organizations uh, and tend to work on the same issues. Uh, there are some things that each organization does uh, a little bit differently. Timber Producers Association has a trade show, the North Star Expo, which was here in Bemidji in 2014 and 2015. Uh, also runs a drug and alcohol testing program for truck drivers, uh, publishes a magazine and does a variety of, uh, of other service types of things. And then would you tell us a little bit about like how long, how did you get into the industry, how long you've kind of been involved with it? A long time, uh, about uh, 27 uh, years that I've been with the uh, two organizations with, uh, with a two year hiatus in the middle when I ran the state's uh, Iron Mining Association. Uh, it's something that you know you can't be part of the fabric of the state of Minnesota without knowing about the importance of the forest products industry. You know whether it's uh, uh, the stories of Paul Bunyan when you're growing up as a little kid, or uh, you know just if you're an aware person, you know that we have a healthy and a vibrant industry. I mean the forest products industry uh, today is uh, depending upon how you want to count it, the fourth or fifth largest manufacturing uh, industry in the state. Uh, we employ about uh, 28,000 people. Uh, and have a value of products that are produced of in excess of eight billion dollars. So it's tough not to know uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, uh, about the industry. And actually, a little known fact: uh, uh, my great grandfather was a logger in uh, Pine County. Oh, interesting. So you said there's about twenty-eight thousand throughout the state that Correct. are employed by the industry. And then in these, this region specifically, are there figures in terms of how many are? I don't have it off the top of my head on, uh, on a county by uh, county basis, but you know I think everybody knows that when we're talking northern Minnesota, it's even a larger uh, impact. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and these are the kind of jobs that uh, you know sustain and support communities. Every job in a sawmill or a board plant like Norboard uh, supports two other jobs outside of the uh, plant. Uh, every job in a paper mill supports four other jobs mm -hmm. outside of plant. So the the spin-offs are uh, are very important, and when we look at our you know at our smaller communities, you know even if you have uh, a small sawmill, you know that'll employ you know three, four, five, six, eight people, you know their families, their children going to school, the trucks or truckers that are moving their you know the wood to them and their finished lumber uh, out to market. So you know it has a very very strong uh, impact. Can you give us a, a brief description perhaps? How do you go from tree to product? Just for those who are maybe unfamiliar with how the industry works. Sure, the, uh, in Minnesota about half of the forest land is owned by uh, the public through okay. the federal government, the state government, or the county government. So they develop management plans, how they want to harvest, you know, what they want to uh, maintain, what they would like the habitats to be uh, in future years, and then they'll develop plans as to what they're going to harvest at any given uh, point in time. And that'll then be sold for the public 
would at auctions. So both mills and loggers will go to those auctions and they'll bid on uh, the wood that's there and acquire the rights, the stumpage, uh, as it's called, uh, rights to a harvest that timber. So the logger will then come in. Companies don't have any logging operations, so it's all independent loggers. Okay. So if it, the logger buys the sale, you know, he or she will work on their sale. If the company buys the sale, they'll contract with a logger to uh, do the logging. So the logger will move their equipment on, uh, meet with the forester uh, as to what the prescription is, uh, how they want it done, lay out roads, skid trails, landings, and all those kinds of things, and then harvest the wood and then be trucked to the mill. Uh, unloaded there, uh, scaled, weighed, uh, so that the landowners get paid uh, based on that. And then the company, depending upon what their finished product is, uh, will begin the process of converting it into that. Wood will be debarked. In the case of oriented strand board, it'll then be stranded. Uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, paper, it'll be pulped. In the case of uh, lumber, uh, it will be you know sawn into, uh, into boards and then uh, wrapped up and finished and put on trucks or rail cars to go out for uh, all the people that need those products. Thank you. We talked a little bit about the, the jobs that are provided and how those actually have a domino effect to provide other jobs and economic benefit. I'm assuming there's been studies to kind of look at that economic impact of the industry. Sure, there's about an $8.2 uh, billion dollar, uh, impact in our state uh, directly. Okay. Uh, if you add uh, indirect and induced jobs, it's about double that, you know, okay. so about 16 or $17 billion uh, worth of activity. For the primary industry, the folks that uh, my organization represent. We also generate about a half a billion dollars in tax revenues, uh, property taxes, corporate income taxes, income taxes, and other taxes paid by the, the folks that uh, work there. So it's a very significant uh, uh, impact uh, in every community uh, that we operate in. So it's fair to say that as the industry, of course, has had some ups and has some downs, but as those happen, you can see it throughout the communities that it has an impact on sure you know you can definitely you can definitely see it uh, I think one of the other things that we've seen uh, through the years like so many industries is technology and capital uh, replacing individuals I mean the days of uh, you know big guys with uh, broad backs uh, out there in the woods uh, on the ground with uh, with saws that's long in the past uh, you know our loggers are out there on uh, feller bunchers and processors that those individuals Individual machines uh, can cost five, six hundred thousand dollars a piece. They're uh, operating joysticks, uh, computer-controlled uh, GPS systems that lay out, you know, what they're going to harvest and how they're going to harvest it. You know, and interestingly. Timber Producers Association has had a, a workers' compensation program uh, with our members for. I don't know, 35 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And if you look back, uh, many of the claims uh, from injuries uh, going back, you know, 20, 30 years were traumatic kinds of industries. Trees falling on people, broken legs, you know, those kinds of things. Now what we see in terms of claims are uh, carpal tunnel injuries from working the oh. joysticks, uh, back problems from uh, sitting in the cabs and the seats, and really, you know, the, the primary uh, traumatic kind of injury that we see is slips and falls getting on and off the machine. So it's a much safer activity. Uh, that's been reflected by when I started in, the, in 1989 in the industry, uh, workers' compensation rates for loggers were $60 for every $100 of payroll. So you'd pay the employee $100 and you'd pay the work comp insurance company $60. Okay. Uh, that has been for a number of years under $10. Oh, wow. uh, so so it's one of the few things that's less. And that's a testament to the uh, technology, the equipment, and the uh, uh, dedication of our members and their employees out in the woods to safety. I mean, I think about it every day. Oh, interesting. I want to move a little bit into like the forests themselves, resource and sustainability. So it's been said that Minnesota forests grow three times more wood than it harvests. Mm -hmm. That's accurate. So who is it that determines how much can be harvested and how that is done? You know, it's done in a similar way for most uh, of the land ownership. So the landowners, uh, particularly the large public landowners, will have inventories of their land. So okay. how much wood, what is it aspen, is it jack pine, is it spruce, is it balsam, uh, is it red pine that's growing out there, you know, what are the ages of it, 
uh, from the different stands and there will be a mosaic of that across the landscape. So they, they will then take that information and through various means, some, you know, mostly these days through computer simulation models where you put that inventory data into the model and we operate one of these in our association ourselves so we can understand what's going on also. Uh, so you load that inventory data in and you say, you know, what we would like to have uh, for our forest in the future is, uh, you know, we want to have habitat uh, for deer, we want to okay. have habitat for grouse, for, you know, forest interior songbirds, uh, for, you know, whatever uh, the objectives are that may be out there. And then you can, using the uh, software, you can plug those things in and say, this is what we would like to have the forest look like in, 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years, and from that then you can make your plans as to what you're going to do, you know, in each period. Typically they will look at 10 year periods of time for, okay. you know, what are the activities that they want to do. And by, by doing it and thinking about it and using that technology, you can say, all right, we need uh, interior habitats for some types of forest songbirds. Well, that doesn't mean that you don't harvest those acres, but it may mean that you look at that and say, if we're going to have forest interior ha habitats for those songbirds that want them in 30 years or 40 years, maybe we have to do a bit bigger patch, or maybe over a period of time, you know, we'll do three or four or five, or maybe two landowners, the state and the county will say, all right, we want to have that created, so we're going to work together in terms of how we're going to lay out our harvest so that that habitat will exist in the future while we're still providing the jobs and the products that we use. So is the plans for the management then differ basically if it's a state versus a county versus a private, it's all tailored individually for that? They, do, they do individual plans. Uh, it, it would take a pretty sophisticated person to go out on the ground and say this is a forest service sale, this is a county sale, uh, this is a DNR sale uh, without having a lot of knowledge. You know, they, they end up with similar types of outcomes, but, you know, as with all levels of government, uh, you know, we tend to be most efficient at the local level, uh, less bureaucracy at the county, uh, a little more at the state, and a little more uh, at the federal government. That's not to say that they do bad management or any of that's wrong. It's just the way it is. Okay. You know, it's just mm -hmm. the way the systems have developed. How important is it to manage forests? What happens if they're not managed? Well, uh, A, uh, you know, they become vulnerable to uh, fire, to uh, insects, to uh, diseases, to uh, windstorms, uh, which, you know, that may have been the natural way, you know, 500 years ago, 300 years ago, but, you know, society has changed. You know, we have a developed society with people living intermingled out and amongst the woods, and, uh, you know, that's really not acceptable. So, you know, we can look at that and say how, what, how and what do we want going forward. Uh, you know, we need to provide some of our products. I mean, if we're not providing the products that we use, then we're shifting, you know, the uh, environmental consequences, if you will, of producing those products to somewhere else. I mean, is it, and we happen to think here in Minnesota that it's much better to uh, produce our products here, have good, strong, vibrant, healthy forests and a good, strong uh, economy. And we can, uh, we think we can have our cake and eat it too. We know there are some resources available, some agencies where people can go to to get help with how to go about managing their forests. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. There, you know, Minnesota has really been a leader in a number of, uh, of these areas uh, for private landowners, people that may own 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 acres. There are a number of programs out there. We, through Minnesota Forest Industries, support uh, the tree farm program. You'll see the little tree farm signs, different uh, mm -hmm. uh, places. That helps people get management plans. There's also, in fact, the state, uh, thank you to our legislators uh, and the government. Governor, uh, earlier this year in the 2016 session, appropriated uh, $2.5 million more to help private landowners get management plans, have some cost share for replanting uh, where that's necessary, uh, and those types of things. So in terms of individual help, that is, you know, a key to uh, folks kind of understanding what they're doing and, uh, and getting the best outcome on their land that they can. Systematically and forest-wide and statewide, 
you know, our industry grew a lot back in the late 80s and uh, through the 1990s. You know, we invested about $5 billion in new plants and equipment uh, here in Minnesota. I mean, we can see that here in the Bemidji area, the potlatch sawmill uh, east of town was, uh, was built uh, from scratch, uh, the Norboard plant uh, back in the 80s uh, west of town uh, was built, and there were expansions at uh, the Paper Mill in International Falls, a new paper mill in Duluth, expansions in Cloquet and other oriented strand board uh, capacity that was built in that time. And some folks got concerned about that. Uh, I mean, we were expanding pretty significantly, a lot of investments. There were questions about uh, are we going to have enough trees? Are we doing the environmentally responsible thing in how we're uh, harvesting and managing? So the state did a number of things. Uh, and I, I don't want to be father time and play the history <laughs> lesson, but, but it is kind of important because Minnesota has been a leader. So the state back in the early 90s did a very large million dollar study of, of okay. all of these issues. The outcomes of that, which continue uh, today, were several different programs and structures. First of all, the Minnesota Forest Resources Council, which I sit on, mm -hmm. which you mentioned uh, in the inter introduction, 17 people uh, okay. from all perspectives, tourism industry, the public agencies, uh, Native American tribes represented, uh, labor is represented, uh, uh, so a broad private landowners, the environmental community, conservation, hunting and fishing groups, a broad Oh, set of perspectives uh, and we meet uh, oh six or eight times uh, a year uh, and have a number of different things that are done there. The first is uh, an integrated set of forest management guidelines so they are a, 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 a guidebook of best practices as to how we should harvest uh, and manage the land. You know what are the best things to do and what are the things not to do. Uh, so that is done. There's also a program of ongoing research. Uh, there's a program of coordination uh, and planning uh, at the landscape level, kind of bigger geographic areas to look at these issues. Uh, and then those guidelines uh, are monitored uh, on a regular basis, pardon me, every couple of years. So actually, Contractors are hired, go out on the ground and look and say, well, all right, you know, we've got these best practices, are we really using them? Well, okay. the answer to that is yes, uh, we really are uh, using them. And in most instances, they really do make a difference in how the, what the outcomes are when we uh, manage and harvest lands. Additionally, we started up, uh, my two organizations started up, and then it was spun off into an independent uh, organization, the Minnesota Logger Education Program. Okay. So that's a continuing education and training program for the folks that are out in the woods. Uh, and about 95% of the wood that's harvested in our state is harvested by loggers that have completed that training. Uh, and we were the first we think anywhere in the world to have uh, biomass harvesting guidelines, which we uh, developed through the Forest Resources Council, trained through the Minnesota Logger Education Program, implemented on, a ground, on the ground for the harvesting of biomass for uh, for the products that come from that. So it's been very progressive. You know, we also Minnesota is also a leader in certification of forests, which there are two different entities that have basically benchmarking standards uh, for uh, forest management and they too go out and do audits on the ground and say are you meeting are you actually doing what you said you would do to the standards of these programs state lands are all certified by both private lands are certified by one the other both counties one the other or both so uh, that's been uh, important because with half of the, pub the forest land being owned by the public, you know, we have to be able to show folks that we're doing a good job. And these are ways that we can show folks that we're doing a good job. Interesting. So let's talk about the future. You know, is there room for expansion within the industry? Are there opportunities for more? Sure, yeah, there's uh, clearly uh, uh, room. Physical supply of wood, uh, you know, as you mentioned at the outset, you know, we grow about three times as much wood as we harvest. Sure. You know, we use in the state right now about 2.6 million cords uh, of wood a year. If you go back 10 years ago, when the recession started and the housing market crashed, we lost the potlatch, then Ainsworth plant, OSB plant that was east of uh, town here. Well, we lost four plants like that at that time. That comprised about a third of all the wood usage. So we went from 
about 4 million chords, uh, a little more down to about 2.6 million chords. So there is, you know, the possibility of doing that. But the challenge is with half of the land being in public hands, uh, is that wood going to be brought to market through the planning and the auction and timber sale process? If there's not sufficient wood on the marketplace, <coughs> which <coughs> frankly there hasn't been over the last uh, year and a half to uh, two years, then we end up back in the cycle that we were in a decade ago with stumpage prices rising rapidly. You know, we've seen nearly a doubling of stumpage prices in Minnesota in the last 18 months, uh, oh. particularly for Aspen. It was selling for about $25 a cord, now selling in the 40s. The last time we saw that happen was in 2004 or 5, running up to the crash in 2006. So if there's not enough wood on the market, then somebody's going to fail, you know, okay. because the product doesn't support that kind of a, of a stumpage price over any long period of time. So you may, if you bring in somebody new and there's not enough wood on the market, you may just lose somebody else that's here. Uh, so that's an outcome that we don't want. Uh, I don't think any community wants to trade, you know, this neighbor's job for maybe this neighbor's opportunity for a job. You know, we want to make the pie bigger. Okay. We touched a little bit on biomass, mm -hmm. but that's been something that's been talked about increasingly over the last, I want to say, decade, give or take. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how that would work and what that impact would be on the industry. Well, our industry uses a lot of biomass uh, okay. and has for uh, many years. You know, basically everything that goes into a mill is going to get used or resold for another uh, use. So, okay. you know, it may be uh, burned to generate electricity, okay. uh, may be uh, converted uh, into uh, uh, the sawdust that comes off of sawmills, which may end up for, you know, animal bedding uh, and things like that. Uh, so, you know, we've been doing that for a, a long time. And basically, it has been the uh, byproducts of the material that's coming in to produce the paper, the lumber, and the oriented strand board. Uh, we have not seen in Minnesota a real significant uh, increase uh, in biomass usage uh, per se. So it's been basically a, a, a come along product okay. in use with the existing industry, which which makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's a very low value conversion. Uh, and with the way our system is working now, so basically the, the, the logger is moving their equipment on, setting up putting in the landings and the skid trails and you know if there's any road work that needs to be done and that's all supported by the paper mill, the sawmill, the oriented strand board uh, plant uh, to you know pay for that through the price of the stumpage. Then you have the biomass that's there also which can be you know chipped ground and then trucked in basically for the, a limited cost. But if that market is going to support the entire cost it changes the economics entirely. So, oh, okay. when and there's also a transportation issue. Some parts of the country have had a big expansion of wood chip plants, primarily for export to Europe. That really hasn't happened much in the Lake States, and a significant part of that is the transportation issue. You know, we don't have year-round deep water uh, transportation uh, to ship that stuff to to Europe. Uh, the seaways, St. Lawrence Seaway, is closed for several months of the year. Okay. Um, so what you're saying is that it, it's been around for a while and it's relatively stable. Mm -hmm. And do you see it possibly increasing as more people come on board? I, I think that when we look at the future of the industry, uh, I think that you know the future of our industry here in Minnesota and nationally, we're going to continue to make OSB. We're going to continue to make lumber. We're going to continue to make paper. But it's not low value conversions like biomass, it's higher value conversions. So okay. it's what Sappy and Cloquet has done to uh, uh, modify their uh, pulp mill with a $170 million investment a couple of years ago to convert that wood fiber into a higher form of cellulose, which is then uh, converted into shirts. Uh, oh, cell phone uh, covers uh, can be made out of cellulose. And there's a lot of research and activity. I mean, at the bench level, I mean, you can convert the cellulose molecules into basically anything you can convert petroleum molecules into. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, those types of conversions, you know, from trees, uh, the chemicals that can be extracted from that, whether it's for pharmaceuticals or other uses, I think that as we look out, you know, 30, if I've been involved in the industry for 30 years, if you look out, you know, I don't think it'll be 30 years, uh, much less than that. 
I think we'll start seeing more of those types of, uh, of conversions. Uh, and I think that's really a good niche for our state and our country. You know, it's using our brains. Uh, it's making products uh, that are the next generation of products while we continue to make the products that we make. Oh, fascinating. That's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the workforce in, in general, okay? So is it pretty vibrant now? I mean, do you have good number in terms of those who've been doing it for a long time and some newcomers to the industry? We do, and for any parents or uh, kids that are watching, treesydoesit.com, <laughs> www.treesydoesit.com has got a series of videos on jobs in our industries, you know, all the way from loggers to foresters to finance and accounting people to nurses in the plants, uh, chemical engineers. I mean, the needs are great. This is a good industry. It's going to be here for a long time. It's not just strong backs uh, anymore. Uh, it's using our heads, using our, our skills, and uh, there are real opportunities uh, for uh, young people uh, growing up. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to continue to focus on that through our educational system. Our state needs a, to continue to invest in the educational system so that uh, students, uh, kids growing up, uh, have the skills uh, that they uh, need to move into these jobs okay. and so that they also know that not all of us have to move to the Twin Cities to oh. make a living. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us don't want to live in the Twin Cities. We want to live up here uh, for good and valid here. reasons, and we have to have jobs up here. Uh, and, you know, it's an important message for, uh, for schools and kids to hear. So are you finding partnerships with schools then and local agencies to kind of help get those messages out? Sure. Bemidji has been very aggressive uh, that way through uh, uh, Bemidji State, through the uh, two-year institutions, uh, through uh, Greater uh, Bemidji uh, Organization, uh, has been really one of the leaders in developing those partnerships and looking out you know not just a year or two but five or ten years as to you know what should we be doing as a as a community and other we would hope other communities would look to Bemidji for that as a model we know that the industry you know it's relying on outside influences you've got fuel you've got housing you've got paper you've got electrical but it looks good the, the outlook for the industry looks strong you have excitement within well you know we're you know we still have the benefit of those investments that were made you know 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so we have competitive uh, facilities, but they're under tremendous cost pressure. Uh, whether it's electricity, I mean, 25% of the cost of making a ton of paper is electricity. Electricity rates, you know, continue to go up. Diesel prices have gone down. That's been helpful. Paper markets, you know, have been kind of wiggling their way down in the internet age. You know, whether or not they've, you know, hit the stabilization point or not, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, we continue to be under cost pressure. But we continue to be optimistic because we've got a good workforce. We've got, you know, wonderful forests. And we've got people that are committed to this industry. Cool. Well, Wayne, I want to thank you for joining us here today on uh, Lakeland Currents, and um, we've learned quite a bit about the industry and where it's headed into the future. So thank you for joining us, and please join us next time. Thank you.